morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, July the 9th, 2019. It is currently 10.06 a.m. Central Time. Let me say that one more time because when I hit the go live button for this live broadcast, there was kind of a delay. Welcome, everyone, to a live broadcast for the VBC66 app. It is Tuesday, July the 9th, 2019. It is currently 10.08 a.m. Central Time. My, my iPad did not want to go live. It was just sitting there waiting, and I started talking. So hopefully now everyone knows what is going on. Um, if you hear a recording of this, this is a live broadcast. It is particularly designed, specifically designed for the VBC66 app and those who use the VBC66 app. If you would like to be a part of all the live broadcast and everything else we post on the VBC66 app, I know I say this every time, but always wanting people to, to get the app. So go to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, do a search for VBC66. VBC stands for Victory Baptist Church. The number 66 stands for the number of books in the Bible. Put it all together, VBC66, get the app. It's been um, kind of a, a slow few days. I haven't posted a lot. Um, I, 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 uploaded, I uploaded the sermon uh, from Sunday. I haven't posted it. Um, I think it's available on Spreaker. Um, I need to get it uploaded to the app, so I'll try to get that done here today as well. Wasn't super happy uh, with the sermon because we spent a lot of time reviewing, but for the local congregation, I felt the review was important because I'm trying to lead them through a flow of thought. For those who listen online, the lengthy review may be more ir irritating because they may have listened to the previous part. You know, they may listen to the uh, the two previous parts literally an hour before they listen to this Sunday sermon. So there, it's it's different. But when you have the people in front of you have a week that you know an entire week separates the one sermon from the next sermon, and so that week long delay they forget a lot of things. And I'm trying to build a a logical flow of thought that I think Paul is making there in Romans chapter 1. For those who don't know what's going on, we've started a a verse-by-verse -verse journey through the book of Romans that's probably going to last about 10 years, and that is not hyperbole. Um, it's going to take a long time. We, we made it to verse 2, um, and we spent a lot of time on verse 2, um, dealing with some hermeneutical issues, and then we jumped down to verse 18 due to all of the controversy that has been going on in culture in relations to homosexuality and some recent sermons that have been preached on the subject. So uh, I'm trying to approach it in a far different way. Instead of just going down to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, make some brief comments and then jump right into the homosexual discussion, I'm trying to fo follow the, the logical progression of thought Paul is establishing in Romans 1, 18 and following, where he also mentions homosexuality. Some people make homosexuality the focal point of that section of scripture, and I don't think it's the focal point. I think it is a part of a larger discussion. So reminding people of the logical progression of thought is going to be important as we work through this section. So hopefully that um, that will be beneficial. So um, I'll try to get to that. I, um, I know the last couple of weeks on Monday morning, I've been posting a, here is this, the week long focus is on this verse or this subject. I haven't been overly pleased with the uh, lack of response for the week long uh, focus. Um, that's a frustrating thing, but that to me uh, says a lot about the state of Christianity today, trying to find a group of Christians who will be actually, who actually desire to spend an entire week focused on a Bible verse or a, or a theological topic or something and getting them to actually study and engage in conversation about it. It's much more difficult than you may think than that it is, but it, it seems to be that way. So I'm, I'm going to try to um, I'm, I'm, I still think, I, I still believe in the cause. I still believe that as Christians, trying to get Christians to say, hey, let's spend a week focused on this and work together and talk about it. I still think that it's a worthy cause. Nobody else may think it, but I think it is. So I'm, I'm going to continue to try to, to, to focus on doing that. My voice was pretty much gone on Monday, so I wasn't able to record. But this is supposed to be a quick broadcast, so let's get right to it, all right? Let's get right to this. Let's start with uh let's let's start with a bible verse all right matthew chapter 24 verse 12 matthew chapter 24 verse 12 
Now, we, we could go through the context of what's going on here, but this, at least, ra- instead, of, um, instead of doing an entire exposition of the context, let me just use this to kind of establish a, an idea, all right? Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. There's an idea clearly being explained here. And because iniquity shall abound, I'm reading this from the King James, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Right, because uh, and then if I read it from other ver- versions, um, if I go to the New International Version, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of mi- of most will grow cold. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. Many see that passage as a prophetic passage uh, about the future. And some will say we are seeing a fulfillment of that. That if you look around within, uh, especially within Christianity, because of the overwhelming um, amount of wickedness that is abounding everywhere around us, the love of many within Christianity, within the church, is growing cold. There is there is something happening within Christianity, and I keep I, I keep hitting record. I keep, um, you know, stating this over and over and over. There is a deadness. There is a, there is a coldness. There is an apathy that is creeping across Christianity. And, and I don't know if it, I don't know if I can get Christians to, to really wake up and see this, but there needs to be someone who has a platform, who has a big voice that needs to speak authoritatively and bluntly to the state of American Christianity. We have heresy abounding. We have compromise everywhere. We have a deadness. We have a coldness. We have an apathy. There, there's things happening within Christianity and someone who has a platform, who people like to listen to, they're going to have to be the ones to look at the church and say, your love has grown cold. You've become apathetic. You need to wake up. You need to repent. We need to care about doctrine. We need to care about theology. We need to care about how to interpret the scriptures. There, there needs to be a, a challenge. And and many who seem to have the platform don't seem to be willing to, to speak, how can I say this, bluntly and directly to Christians. We, we seem to be, we've, we've been hijacked by political concerns, cultural concerns, but the church has a problem. So I just saw this news article a little while ago and thought I would use this just as a, just as a quick thing to get you to think about this, all right? Headline, one-fifth of all churches in the Netherlands are no longer being used as houses of worship. One-fifth of all churches in the Netherlands are no longer being used as houses of worship. Here's the story. Over a fifth of all churches in the European nation of the Netherlands are no longer being used as places of worship, according to research conducted by a Dutch newspaper. One-fifth of all churches, they're just no longer being used as places of worship. What happened? Well, despite being a traditionally Christian country, in the late 19th century, roughly 60% of the population population were active Protestants, Holland has seen a rapid decline in the faith ever since. Now, this area is very important in church history. The, the Synod of Dort, I know we've been talking about that at Victory Baptist Church. This area, there's some major church history there, but it's been a, a steady decline since the 19th century. As a result um, of its research, the news outlet discovered that a vast number of churches have now been converted into apartments, offices, and libraries, or are being utilized for other social or cultural activities. Staggeringly, okay, and a, a staggering statistic, around 1,400 of the 6,900 registered church buildings are no longer being used, are now being used for non-religious purposes. 1,400 of the 6,900. Now, among the Catholic denomination, however, churches are more likely to be seen as holy and consecrated spaces and are therefore rarely repurposed into non-worship facilities. That's interesting. Within the Catholic world, the Catholic, the Catholic churches are seen as, as, as I like, I like the, the way they describe it, 
holy and consecrated spaces. I wish Protestant churches could be seen as consecrated spaces. And when I say consecrated, consecrated in the sense that they should be set apart for the use of the things of God, for the proclamation of his word, the teaching of his word, discipling people. But yet many Protestant churches, they'll use it. Their buildings are used for all kinds of things. And, um, I remember being a teenager in the Southern Baptist Church and playing Capture the Flag late at night for a youth activity in the church, and also including the main sanctuary. That would not have, you know, that that kind of that kind of way of thinking is foreign to many other groups, but within some Protestant groups, it's not. I wish the church itself would be consecrated as a place of worship, a place of teaching, not a place for all the the foolishness that takes place in American churches. But that's a whole different subject. Um, for Roman, uh, for Roman Catholics, the church is sacred for Protestants. The church is useful. That's, that's a good quote for Roman Catholics. The church is sacred for Protestants. The church is useful. I think many Protestants carry that mentality into the church. If it's useful for me and if I get something out of it, great. If not, I'll go find me another one or I'll start my own. I think there, there's a lot going on here. All right. Uh, the sentiment, um, let me see, uh, um, the sentiment is reflected in the figure some 850 of roughly 3,000 Protestant church buildings built since the year 1800 are no longer used for Christian gatherings. All right. And we could, um, church attendance has also seen a dramatic decline in 1971. 37% of the population would attend a religious service on a regular basis. In 2017, this figure was sitting at just 16%. So in 2017, uh, 16%. It would be interesting to get the st- statistics for 2019 and see if it's if it's dropped down to around 10%. That's a reality there in the Netherlands. That's that's a reality there. But here's like what I'm trying to say. Whatever the church, whatever the, the attendance numbers are, whatever the number of churches in America that are being used for religious purposes and the ones that have been, you know, repurposed for different uses, it, all, some of those statistics don't really matter. The overall p- point I wanted to use that story for is that it, it is a vivid external picture of what I believe is happening within Christianity. I believe Christianity is being repurposed. I believe Christianity is being repurposed not for the proclamation of the word of God and for worshiping God and serving God. Christianity is being repurposed for social activity, relationships, and politics. Christianity is being repurposed in the United States of America to, to we got to be a place of fun, food, and entertainment. We got to be a place for social agenda. We got to be a place for political ideology. And it stopped being the church and the bride of Christ. It's being repurposed. Christianity is being repurposed as not the place to proclaim the word of God with or without offense to friend or foe because scripture is going to offend anyone who hears it. It's going to offend the Christian. It's going to offend the non-believer if they hear the word of God proclaimed with any form of bluntness and authority. No, we're going to compromise and take a step back and go, well, we don't want to offend anyone. And the times are changing, right, to use, to use a cliche. And so we've got to change with the times. So we got to change our stance on homosexuality. We got to be a little bit more careful and we got to be and we we want to be we want to talk about this social issue and this social issue and stop being people who proclaim the word of god things are happening and and it's going to require the christians who care to show they care by committing themselves anew to their christian faith to becoming passionate about the word of god to actually being people of faith who are passionate about their faith as wickedness abounds, the love of many grow cold. And the reason it impacts the church is what happens in the culture, it impacts the church. There's an apathy to religion, even within culture. There's an apathy to it. There's an apathy even to the question of God. And I believe that apathy is now showing itself in the church. And the Netherlands, it's dramatic. Churches are just closing down and being used for something else. In America, it may not be that dramatic, but I'm telling you, many denominations are seeing major decline in their membership numbers. There are still mega churches in America, but many of those mega churches, right? Not all of them, but many of them. Is that even Christianity anymore? 
What is Christianity? I don't even know if many Christians can define what Christianity is in any meaningful way. Because within the Protestant world, they threw out the creed, so there's no creedal guidelines to what Christianity is. There's no confession of faith of what Christianity is, because we've abandoned church history, abandoned Orthodox creeds, abandoned Orthodox confessions of faith, and, and the church is being repackaged.